one. Good afternoon. At least it's good afternoon in Washington and on the East Coast, having just turned noon. Uh, and welcome to this United States Energy Association virtual press briefing on the transformative future of utilities. I am Llewellyn King, your host and organizer of these briefings. The question before the House today is how the mounting pressures on this sector will contribute to its transformation. As usual, a panel of experts is questioned by a panel of journalists who cover energy. Before I introduce the panels, Mark Menzies, President and CEO of USEA and former Deputy Secretary of Energy, will give you his welcome and tell you about the work of the association. Mark. Thank you very much, Llewellyn. I'm looking forward to uh, this, uh, this conversation today on a very important issue. You know, the U.S. Energy Association is a non nonprofit organization, and we're comprised of energy associations, public and private companies, NGOs, individuals, to foster the advancement of the entire energy industry, both in the U.S. and internationally. And unlike other trade associations, USEA is an apolitical, non-lobbying organization founded back in 1924 as part of the World Energy Council. And back then, as it is today, uh, is the real concern for the need of affordable energy to provide basic human needs and for national security. And to accomplish this mission, uh, we convene energy stakeholders to share U.S. policy and technological breakthroughs to advance affordable, reliant, resilient, and clean energy sources uh, here in the United States and globally. And internationally, we promote energy development by expanding opportunities to safe, sustainable, and environmentally acceptable energy in partnership uh, with the U.S. government. We have longstanding relationships with USAID, the State Department, and the Department of Energy to help them accomplish these goals. So you can see our mission is aligned with today's topic, Llewellyn. So we really look forward uh, to the, today's conversation. I wanna thank uh, all of our panelists and for the journalists who are attending today. Thank you. I'd like to add my thanks to Kimberly Grover of USEA, who is so helpful in putting these together. Our panelists today are Melanie Kinderdine, Principal and Executive Vice President of the Energy Futures Initiative. She has worked for the Department of Energy extensively, having first begun with the, unfortunately, because he died very recently, um, Bill Richardson. Uh, she worked for him in Congress as well as Chief of Staff, and for Ernie Moniz, who now heads the initiative. Um, Howard Co Google. Vice President at Merck, and we're looking to forward to hearing from you, Howard, about projections for electricity demand. Rudy Garza, President and CEO at CPS Energy in San Antonio, Texas, the largest uh, gas and electric municipally owned utility in the country. David Naylor, President and CEO at Rayburn Electric Cooperative in Rockville, Texas, and I must say, these two utilities have borne the, borne the battle uh, during the extreme heat in Texas, and I'm keen to know what the lessons that they learned there are. And Joe Tinemeyer, Chief Technology Officer and Senior Vice President at Enesis, which is largely a storage company, and we're looking forward to learning about the role of storage in offsetting a potential supply crisis. And Elliot Roseman, Program Manager at USEA, and Elliot has extensive experience and can tell us also about the problems in Europe and, and Asia uh, faced by utilities and how similar they can be or how different they are. Our reporters are Matthew Daly of the Associated Press, uh, Herman Trevish of Utility Dive, Ken Silverstein of Forbes, and Matt Chester of Energy Central. We'll go right to the questions. And Matt Chester, would you like to start us off? Sure thing. Thanks, Llewellyn. And, and thanks for all of our panelists for being here. Um, among all the, the various pursuits and transformations that I know we're, we're excited to talk about today taking place in the utility sector, 
I, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, and any of our panelists comment on kind of the role that they think policy can or should play. You know, we have, we're not that far off from elections coming up and uh, grid reliability, power affordability, sustainability, they're all gaining attention. So uh, overall, are you seeing policies as a way to uh, advance progress or, or is it creating more red tape? You know, what would you position as the best role we can hope for from the policymaker side? I think maybe Melanie should take that. Right. I was I was going to say I ran the uh, policy office when Bill Richardson was secretary and ran the policy office when Ernie Moniz was secretary. So demonstrating I made no progress in my career over that period of time. But but I think that that policy right now is critical and and uh, we are facing uh, very serious uh, threats from climate change and we need to accelerate the clean energy transition that cannot be done without a uh, support of policies. I, I was uh, interested to see, uh, because I spend my lifetime on airplanes, uh, reading the Harvard Business Review, the most recent edition, and it said, we need industrial policy. Um, uh, I think that, I think that uh, that used to be words you could not speak. Um, I think that 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 it is critical now, and and uh, we need a, a host of thoughtful, sequenced policies uh, to enable the clean energy transition in in uh, as rapidly as possible, and we need it rapidly. So. Um, if I could uh, just jump in on uh, build upon what Melanie has just said, uh, there are policies uh, clearly at different levels, right? There's federal policies. Uh, we have the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the money that it's uh, putting in, and that's sort of got a lot of embedded sort of policy prescriptions uh, in there. We've got policies at the state level. The regulators are going to be very important going forward at the state level, and also, uh, you know, policies of implementing how to integrate uh, renewables and make this uh, transition that will be both by the utilities and by the RTOs. So policy uh, more broadly, I think uh, you can look at different levels of policy and how it, it can be affected made uh, to to make that transition more effective. I, I totally agree with that, Elliot. And and, uh, and and but I would go back to the thoughtful and sequenced policies. And I think that the situation in Ukraine and Europe uh, indicated how we need to be thoughtful and sequence uh, policies uh, because because uh, uh, at you know they very very. Uh, uh, supportive of renewables in in the EU, but they urgently needed natural gas. And just a data point: the uh, Russia they lost 22 BCM from Russia. The United States provided them 19 BCM over over a, a year's period of time. And so so uh, uh, it needs to be sequenced. We can't do everything all at once, and we need to be thoughtful about it. So. If I could add something to uh, every other year, NERC puts out a reliability risk report. And this year, for the first time, we identified policy risk as one of the risks to reliability that we need to be monitoring. Not, not bad, not good, but certainly something that, that is a risk that we need to be monitoring. Thank you, Hard. Mark, would you like to add anything? You come out of the um, DOE and were very close to policy under previous administration. Right. I mean, I, you know, the question I would have is really uh, where do you need policy from? So Congress, you know, passed when they when it enacted the IRA, it made some conscious choices, deliberate choices, I should say, um, to provide tax incentives and grant monies. And to that end, sort of prioritized the policy implementation, but generally left it to those tax credits uh, and grants and loans uh, to sort of foster, I think, uh, the development of the energy systems as a way to meet President Biden's climate goals uh, and for the reasons that Melanie uh, talked about. So, uh, I, you know, you see FERC looking at transmission policies, you have Congress conducting oversight, you have Treasury trying to get guidance out. Um, you know, what needs to be done? Uh, what In what order, right? What what is blocking the achievement of what Congress did? And I think everybody agrees what Congress did last Congress was, was truly historic. 
So I think there's a lot of interest <clears throat> in developing these new technologies, uh, implementing what Congress has said, but what what are the hurdles? What are the challenges that we need to overcome? Thank you. I think, I think from uh, Merck's perspective, it would be a coordinated effort, right? Uh, you, you see policy developed at the national scale, at the state scale, at the local scale, but they don't really coordinate with each other and they can sometimes be conflicting. And so I think uh, looking at that from a reliability perspective, but also from consumer perspective would be really good. Thank you. Matthew Daly, Associated Press. Hey, well, thanks for having this uh, call. I, I was going to just sort of follow up on that in terms of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. There's been a lot of, you know, stories about the one year anniversary and just sort of getting everyone to sense or how well it's going or how, how many obstacles there really are, because it seems like depending on who you talk to, you know, it's either the greatest bill ever or it's still a work in progress. And I'd be interested to see how much of what what Congress did has been implemented and, and where, how close are we to A, meeting the goals on climate, but also B, keeping the lights on. Who would like to take that? Well, this is Rudy Garza down in San Antonio. You know, we've hired an army of folks to help us maneuver, you know, the uh, guidance that's coming out of the federal agencies on uh, the IRA, the IIJA, the, there's different opportunities you know, depending upon where you, what you're looking to do. I'll tell you, it's been slow. I think uh, I expect the opportunity to be there, but uh, understanding exactly how the projects that we plan to do down here in San Antonio is actually going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, assisted by some of these available, uh, you know, buckets of, of money at the federal level, it's still really hard to, you know, to, to, to get our arms around. So, uh, we've hired some of the, the 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 best folks in the industry, and you know, uh, you know, don't have a lot of skins on the wall just yet. So uh, I do expect uh, the 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 guidance to come and the the money to start trickling out. But it has been a slow go so far. I, I gotta I gotta be honest. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll echo um, that uh, as well. Just uh, you know, Rayburn's kind of the same thing, Rudy. We we haven't hired a, 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 an army, but. You know, we've started looking at strategic partners which from other universities and other uh, entities that are there as well. But it's uh, it's, it's it's been a slog and uh, and a slow go as well. Maybe you know, we can can lend you a few troops. <laughs> you know, one of the uh, things that we've uh, perceived is that the IRA uh, had the impact of motivating a lot of uh, developers of renewable projects, in particular, and a lot of private equity money to begin to uh, see these carrots that were being uh, uh, held out and to upgrade their applications and to really add to the queue, which has now become a bit of a, of a bottleneck, uh, add many of the RTOs and utilities around the country of this backlog of applications. And queue management is actually becoming a much bigger deal, I think, as a result. The RTOs, we recently interviewed a number of RTOs as part of a report we're doing on best practices for queue management worldwide. Uh, and what we've seen is that the, the RTOs and utilities need to up their game. And of course, FERC order 2023 is in part trying to respond to all of that as well. We can get into details on that, but uh, the, the I would agree with the uh, other comments that the progress has been slow, but I think it's gonna pick up quickly as, as entities begin to try to grapple with the, the uh, supply on the supply side with a lot of the renewable applications that are coming in the door. So I can okay. look at it from a different perspective as a manufacturer and, and a benefactor of the IRA. And I would say for our storage system strategy, for instance, moving towards more lithium cells, it's been um, an accelerant. And, and so we are doing things now that we wouldn't have planned on doing or thought about doing many years down the road that we're starting immediately. So for us, uh, it's been highly beneficial and highly focusing for us to move into new revenue sectors. If I could say too, and, and put in a word for the Department of Energy, where I worked for 12 years as a political appointee, the, the, um, uh, it's a, it is a huge infusion of money into the agency. And, um, and uh, quite frankly, a lot of restrictions have been placed on agencies. Uh, many placed on them by by uh, Congress about how to deal with and accommodate uh, uh, 
uh, funding and getting money out the door, but I think that they are doing an exceptional job. And it, it, it's great to hear that that uh, you are you uh, that that industry is incentivized by this as well. And uh, I, I think that that uh, we are going to start seeing significant results in the very near future, as you just said too. So, thank you, Herman Trebish. Uh Llewellyn, thanks for uh, having me to be part of this. Um, I am here today from Las Vegas, uh, from the RE Plus uh, conference. It's the biggest renewables conference in the United States. And um, there is a lot of discussion about the IRA. And I think it's newsworthy and relevant to report that in answer to some of the questions and, and observations about the IRA, the renewables industries at the last two conferences I've attended, the big win-win and this one, are head over heels. They are, and there's all these signs that the change that Rudy wants is coming. So I'm I'm trying to act as a reporter here, not as a, a, a booster. Um, there's over twice as many people at this conference. It was already the biggest uh, renewables conference in the United States last year, but uh, there's twice as many people here this year. And I'm running into people I've known for years who've been working for advocacy organizations, the Solar Energy or, or Industries Association, SEPA, other uh, battery associations. They're moving to the private sector because they know what's coming in order to serve Rudy's needs. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, David's as well. Um, so those are, there's expected to be more than half a trillion dollars uh, coming into the energy sector and an enormous amount of jobs coming. And no one expected, I think, the, of the people I've re I've talked to from my reporting, I, I think no one really expected it to happen overnight. Everyone knew that it was going to take a lot of IRS guidance and they're waiting and they're seeing that that's happening. So um, they're planning on pinning those skins to the wall, Rudy, but they're, <laughs> they're not planning on doing it this year is basically what I'm saying. And we're not talking just about solar. We're talking here at this conference about representatives from battery storage and representatives from um, uh, the electric vehicle industries. There's a huge turnout in electric vehicle uh, uh, companies here to develop um, uh, strategies and policies and partnerships in building charging. But my, so, and, and, but that, leads to a question that I wanted to ask Howard, and I'd like to then subsequently get in, input from David and Rudy on this. Howard, I was just looking over the, the final report that you NERC made to FERC on uh, the 2021 outages in Texas. Of course, now we've seen this dreadful situation in Hawaii. Our hearts all, all go out to the folks in, in Hawaii. And before, before what happened in Texas, we saw a terrible thing that happened in Paradise, California. Human lives are being lost. In Texas, you pointed to the failure of natural gas uh, facilities as the majority cause of that. So I'd like to know exactly how you interpret that data. And then I'd like to get Rudy and David to talk about how they're reacting to the use of natural gas in response to what you found in your final report. Yeah, I would say that's uh, that was certainly one of the things that we that we found there. And you'll see... Uh, our investigation that we're currently conducting right now of, of the winter of 2022 that occurred across Christmas time in the Northeast, and we're seeing similar things happen there. Um, you've got scenarios where uh, grid operators weren't aware of where critical load on the gas side was. Uh, and so we're working on standards to increase uh, awareness on that. Uh, and then uh, you've got uh, a concern that we've got is that you know some natural gas facilities aren't actually preparing for winter. They're not winterizing. They're not hardening for that. So we had freeze offs occur at some of the wellheads. Uh, we had some of the pump stations that were interrupted for load uh, because you know other load was being interrupted at the same time too. Um, so it, we're we're seeing that, and it's kind of ironic that uh, the 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 turn that we've seen to renewables is actually increasing our reliance on natural gas because we need generation that can follow load and, and follow that renewable generation as it goes up and down during the day. 
And so, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of, uh, I've explained it to the gas industry that there's kind of a symbiotic relationship now between gas and electricity. We're both, you know, very reliant upon each other. Anybody from... Let me just, Llewellyn, if I may, because um, I wanted to get Rudy and David's response to that, that situation with natural gas. And it appears to me that uh, their Let's move the question. Right. Let's hear from... Let's hear from Rudy, uh, from Rudy, or, or from David. Yeah, I'll, I'll be really succinct in my in my response. Uh, you know, absolutely, the lack of natural gas production was a was a challenge during Winter Storm Uri. And what we've seen, you know, here in Texas, is the winter peak, you know, rivals the summer peak these days in those moments where it gets really, really cold across the entire system. I don't believe that our regulatory authorities in um, in, in Texas have addressed that issue. I, I, I believe it's still a risk. Uh, I'll be litigating our gas supply situation during that time for the next several years. Um, you know, as a result of a failure in that regard. Uh, but you know how we you know kind of use a combination of renewables with the backstop. Of natural gas is going is a question that we still got to answer as we move uh, into the future. But I'll tell you, you know, probably my number one priority at CPS Energy right now is getting my gas supply strategy right and diversifying where that gas is coming from as a result of our experience during winter storm year. I got to get more gas out of South Texas uh, than than I than I do out of the Permian Basin, you know, just because of those gas well heads freezing up. Uh, during opportune times of of the winter, so uh, it is still an issue that that we're we're challenged with. That the the uh, Rudy the the gas and electricity are regulated by different agencies in Texas. Okay, and I mean that was when we looked at the uh, the problem in Texas in I don't know 2021 whatever year it was. Uh, that that was a, a pretty significant issue. What was basically the lack of communication between the two entities in Texas specifically. So, yeah, and and the work that's been done is really focused on the the kind of energy supply chain uh, right, in right. Texas. Um, I, I do think we've made some progress there, but there's absolutely no requirement for firm gas supply during you know these critical times, right, right. which is still where the gap is. You know, I could jump in uh, on this also uh, in response to Herman. The uh, job one, of course, is keeping the lights on, right? I mean, there another other things may uh, follow and flow from that, but we that's uh, the reliability uh, issue is paramount. And so it seems to me as though as we're looking at this transformation, which is massive, we're talking about how to effectively make that transition. Right now, with a lot of new, say, solar and wind or intermittent resources coming online, you may need gas combustion turbines as backup, but as storage, and I'm sure that our colleague from uh, the storage company will have to be able to comment on this, as storage becomes more and more economic, um, it will, I think, increasingly compete with gas for being the backup or the go-to resource, you know, for making sure that the, that the lights stay on. And so, you know, a recent NERC report, uh, or N I'm sorry, NREL report indicated if we could get another about 50% reduction in the cost of storage, I'm talking about all the different types of storage that are available, and a bit more on the efficiency side, that it would become economic. And you see a lot of the backlog of the proposals in the, in the queue proposed to come online being combined solar and storage projects in particular. So it's that uh, we're in that three to five year, I would say, transition period when the, the gas versus storage uh, uh, competition, I would say, is going to play out. David, uh, let's hear from another actual operating person who has to keep the lights on, not theorize about it. Uh, I mean, I think one of the challenges from Winter Storm Uri is it effectively put a price tag on that reliability. Um, and 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 made that you know unfortunately like you said loss of life became a, an element there that you, you you would obviously much rather not have to deal with you know from from Raymond's standpoint we actually acquired a, a natural gas a facility this year uh, really as a, a fallout from uh, the winter storm year I mean that was a big step for us uh, but it came boil down to, hey, we need to be able to control our own own destiny here. Because uh, I, I, I totally agree with Rudy. Uh, the, the problem's not been solved uh, for, for Rayburn. 
even though we're right outside of the Dallas area, we're actually a winter peaking system. And, you know, we can see our, our load swing as much as 30 to 40% just with a, a cold front that comes through. And being prepared for that is tough. But, you know, you know, back to, to Melanie's point on the, on the difference uh, regulatory uh, agencies on, on natural gas, one of our big criteria when we acquired the plant that we acquired was it had the interstate uh, gas. So it was regulated by FERC, not by uh, in, internal. I mean, if it was just uh, intrastate facilities and located or had the sole, sole uh, regulation within Texas, I mean, that frankly was just almost a non starter for us. Um, Ken Silverstein. Uh, oh, hi, Llewellyn. Thank you for having me. Uh, this question might be for Melanie, but anybody can address it. Um, I have a story coming out tomorrow. Um, it, it's a company that makes green hydrogen uh, at an industrial level. Um, and the, the, the theme of it is that green hydrogen is now cost competitive with gray hydrogen, uh, given the Inflation Reduction Act and other incentives. Um, and that in the near term, the cost of green hydrogen will keep declining because electrolyzer prices will fall, renewable energy prices will continue to fall, thereby making green hydrogen more of the go-to source in the very near future. And I just wanna see if you guys agree with that thinking or what you might say about it. Melanie, why didn't you take that and just finish off what you wanted to say in the previous part of conversation? Um, yeah, the, the, the only thing I would, uh, on the previous, uh, two things on the previous discussion, um, the competition between storage and natural gas for the firming, the, uh, 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 I think, illustrates when we get to the point where they're actually completely competitive, how we need to be very careful about the policies um, uh, that we use to transition from one to the other. I would also say that that everything now relies on electricity. We looked at our lifeline networks, uh, seven or eight of them, um, electricity, they are all rely on electricity. And we need to be very, very mindful of that as as electricity as the Uber infrastructure uh, uh, going forward. Gas systems rely on electricity as well. So, so, uh, so uh, thinking about that and our alliance, um, uh, I think is an issue we need to spend a lot more time uh, thinking about on uh, on green hydrogen. The numbers I've seen. Um, uh, suggests that green hydrogen is still more expensive than blue hydrogen, uh, substantially more expensive. I do understand the costs are coming down. And Ken, I'm not familiar with with uh, the story and what data uh, are are behind the uh, the uh, decline in the uh, the uh, cost of uh, uh, green hydrogen. What I would say on on green versus blue. I think it's going to be, there are going to be regional decisions that are made um, on the green versus blue cost. Uh, do you have uh, uh, sequestration opportunities, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so I think that we are, are, uh, are facing some regional decisions as to, uh, to uh, whether um, you use blue or green hydrogen. The, the one other thing about green hydrogen, and I've heard a lot about we can use surplus renewables uh, for the electrolyzers for green hydrogen. Uh, we did an analysis of that and it gives you a 10% capacity factor for your electrolyzers when you do that. So, so there are a lot of issues associated with that. I think ultimately we will move to green hydrogen. We have to be mindful that there are very regional differences in the country. And, and support both, quite frankly, right now. So. Thank you. Um, we have a question, and we have a whole lot of questions coming in from viewers. Uh, this is from Mike Swearingen, and he writes or asks, as an engineer who has worked in interconnecting renewable energy generation 
on power systems, my concern is renewable energy does not meet the definition of firm power. In developing clean energy, you are concerned that the renewable generation technology as it currently stands does not meet the criteria of what is considered firm power, power available on demand. Anybody want to uh, answer Mike's uh, well, question? Yeah, again, I'll try to be brief because we got a lot of really smart folks on the on the on the call today that what will want to chime in. Re renewables absolutely <clears throat> play a role uh, in the market. They've kept prices low during a really really hot summer. They've moved uh, the 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 challenging part of our system peak on a daily basis into the evening. Um, you know, so where, whereas it used to get tied around three or four o'clock in the afternoon when it's really hot. Now it's seven, eight, nine o'clock in the evening when solar starts ramping down, wind may be ramping down um, and you got to, you know, bring on some gas to replace that. Uh, batteries are going to help make that solar, extend that solar uh, into the evening hours. And we saw that here in Texas uh, this summer. But, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, that mentality in my mind is just a, kind of a mentality of the past. The transition that's happening is happening and it's gonna happen whether you like it or not. And so operators across the system are gonna to have to learn how to make it all work together and renewables actually keep prices affordable, you know, during those really hot summer days when it would otherwise, you know, the price would go up during the day. So, you know, so I don't, I'm not a big, you know, subscriber to that theory. Yes, we need more dispatchable, uh, power to you know power generation to back up those renewables, but it's all got to fit together, uh, and and we're learning as we go uh, how to make it all work. But renewables have have really helped Texas make it through the summer this year. Like, let me. Uh, Jan, let me would you in. like? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just a moment, Jan. Would you yeah. like to uh, uh, chime in here and tell us the state of battery development and what we can expect going forward? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of lithium that's being deployed right now um, at the megawatt scale level. Um, and this does aid the problem that, that Rudy was speaking of, right? And, and, and the issues around this will just get predominantly worse. I mean, as we start electrification, for instance, and a lot of people say, well, I'll just charge at night. Well, Rudy just mentioned it. This, this is when renewables uh, start to move away from the system. So the the way to answer this is actually more intelligent control. It's integrated intelligent controls uh, where we have controls right into what the loads are. This may be the HVAC system. This may be lighting systems where signals can be provided. And it's not just about a, a, a looking at a, a storage device that can immediately act in. That's part of a solution. But if we need to look at it from a holistic ecosystem perspective. Thank you. Matt Chester. Thanks. Uh, so a, a story that kind of plays under the surface of a lot of what we're talking about today is the future of the uh, the energy workforce. And we've we've kind of heard rumblings about potential shortages of workers for the clean energy clean energy future as we look at policies like the IRA that are seeking to fast track development. Uh, so I want to ask, what are some of the ways that utilities and, and others in, in this space can compete for the the scale and the qualities of the workers they need, perhaps pulling from heavyweights like those in uh, Silicon Valley. And, and I'd love to hear from Rudy and David specifically on their thoughts and strategies here. So I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I mean, in the last, uh, I mean, last probably three or four years, Rayburn's averaged hiring about 15, 15 folks. Um, so we've been, we've gone from uh, 20 employees and we're over 80 employees now. So, I mean, it's, uh, that's, we're, we're very active in that, in that market. Um, you know, what we found are a couple of things. Uh, one is what's, what's the environment that we're able to, to have. So, uh, you know, we're the very things that we're talking about here, the opportunities that present themselves, you know, those are challenges that we're finding is attracting uh, really talented folks. And we're able to, you know, get them, you know, they're able to come in, they have an opportunity, uh, they're able to make to contribute. Uh, immediately. And, you know, we don't let the fact that they don't have any industry experience get in the way. You know, it's, we're, we're hiring several that are straight out of college. Uh, we've ramped up an, uh, an intern program. So we're getting some uh, benefit from people who are in, you know, in school and then, you know, coming out. So, I mean, definitely, definitely green folks. 
uh, and and I've got one one guy who tells me the more Gen Zs we hire, the less Zs he gets. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, each generation has its it has its uh, its challenges. I mean, my generation was the same had some of the same stuff talked about it uh, when I was coming through. But uh, you know, we're we're finding that we're 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 attracting a, a lot of different types. It's it's uh, what can we offer? Uh, and and frankly, folks like to have the challenge, and and we're we're releasing them to let them tackle that cha- those challenges. Yeah, I, I guess what I'd add is the jobs of the future are going are to look a lot different than the jobs of the past in the energy uh, in our space. We've hired 500 people over the last couple of years, and I've got two coal plant units that will be retired before 2030. Uh, those folks are already starting to transition to other job categories uh, that we need. Uh, and so, you know, we've kind of got a, a really seamless plan to, to, to repurpose those folks to, to jobs of the future. The IRA will make it. Um, uh, more attractive for municipally owned utilities like us to own uh, our our solar farms, which right now we we really primarily do through PPAs with the partner. Uh, and and so once we start owning some of our own solar capacity, we'll need folks to to manage uh, you know those plants as well. So you know so again, our focus really is on um, on, on the transition holistically of our industry, which includes the workforce. And for instance, and you hit the, the nail on the head, Matt, I got to I got to hire data, you know, anal- analysts, I've got to hire cybersecurity, you know, folks. So, you know, so I'm absolutely going to be competing, you know, with the big data folks for, you know, the, the type of skills that I need, because it's going to be all predictive analytics and AI, you know, going forward and how we utilize our precious capital to, to really, you know, drive reliability, you know, in the right direction. So again, the, 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 the utility employee of the future is going to look a lot different than the utility employee of the past, but I'm still going to need linemen. Uh, and when we're doing a pretty good, good job hiring those folks too. Could I say, could I say, could I say a couple of things on that too, that, that we've had a partnership with the AFL CIO. They, they have incredible training programs and they have been very actively engaged in training for the clean energy transition. And so, so I think that's very important. But I also would say that the the jobs and the, the and the workers that we need, it's and the facilities. It's not just about uh, it's not just about utilities. Um, and and just just a, a, a data point. The I did a reference frame. Princeton Net Zero analysis says we need to increase our high voltage transmission system capacity. 75 percent by 2030. Okay, that's not very far away. And I did a series of calculations. We need 360,000 towers to to meet that ob- objective. Uh, high voltage transmission towers. Okay, and they're made from aluminum, steel, and copper. So are wind turbines. So are so are the wires on the. Uh, the transmission lines, et cetera, et cetera. So we need we need facilities and workers for that as those those kinds of things as well. The infrastructure needs uh, for electricity and the clean energy transition. I think you know for a company um, right now having people and, and and we're inundated with this problem with our current factories that we have. We have numerous right. factories across the United States. Um, right. After COVID, it's been an enormous problem making sure that that we have them sufficiently staffed with sufficiently trained people, and we're we're building now also a gigafactory. And our one of our number one areas of concern is a workforce available, and is that workforce well educated enough that we can bring them to to move and accelerate what we need to do very quickly. Uh, you know, one we don't have the time to do this learning by doing, unfortunately. You know, one other area where new staffing is needed, and we found this in interviewing some of the RTOs in this country, is just in reviewing and assessing and evaluating the backlog of renewable projects that are they're applying for connection. We need people who are economists. We need engineers. We need people who are doing the uh, the analytics. We need new modeling uh, techniques. I mean, there is a whole new uh, family. There's several dozen people each, you know, at MISO, at PJM, at SPP who are just involved in trying to review and evaluate and integrate the uh, renewables. And it's a whole new you know, set of, of skills that is going to be important going forward. And just to add on what Melanie you know, just said, in terms of the need for new transmission capacity, 
An el another element of that is how quickly the utilities are going to integrate the grid enhancing technologies or GETs. And, I, and there's a whole group of technologies there that might be able to some extent mitigate the number of new lines uh, or upgrades that are actually needed. So at the same time as we're dealing with all of this uh, transition in, in personnel and in the challenges of bringing on renewables, we're dealing with um, a, a technological changes in the grid uh, area as well that can help to ease that transition. And Elliot, on the the analysis that I just the, the data that I just uh, threw out there, um, the seventy five percent increase in capacity, I assumed in that three hundred sixty thousand uh, tower number, forty percent was increasing capacity on lines with new technologies. Sixty percent, sixty percent was new miles. Okay, gotcha. and so I kind of you know uh, it was arbitrary, but I did. Uh, try to accommodate the new technologies that we have to get more power onto lines. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Daly. I will thank you. I wanted to ask about the electric grid itself and the security. It seems like there's been an increasing number of attacks, some of them getting attention in the media and some of them not. And just what are the power companies and NERC and FERC, what is everyone doing to protect the grid, because I think that this is an increasing problem. And, and I'm going to let the utilities answer that, but I'm you will find I'm a data nerd. Okay, the first quarter of 2018, there were eight cybersecurity attacks. The first quarter of 2023, there were 62 on the grid. So attacks are increasing. It's a, it's a growing problem, obviously. Yeah, I, I'll. Uh, I guess from my perspective, you know, we're running a, a really old system here at CPS Energy, and I think all utilities uh, are having going to have to invest in up, updated enterprise systems. We're about to make a three hundred million dollar investment uh, in ours to to really enhance our ability to protect our systems. We get thousands of attempts a day, uh, you know, on our systems, and we've got really great cybersecurity experts that help protect us. We've got a great collaboration of government entities across our community that help protect one another uh, when, when they see things happening uh, in that space uh, that where we need to protect ourselves. But, you know, again, you know, we, we uh, I want to go back to the very first question on this panel, the role policy plays in the energy transformation. You know, the, the regulation and, and the, the auditing that happens, you know, uh, from NERC, um, the, 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 the pressure we're getting out of the EPA to lower carbon, you know, the technology investment that's coming out of the DOE, all of these, you know, have to work together to allow us to protect our systems, to main re maintain reliability, and to move into the transformation. Uh, but, but we you know, as an operator, you got to you got, we got it coming at us from all sides, you know, where the policies aren't always consistent with one another. And, you know, I, I mean, we spend hundreds, hundreds of, of, of man hours a year preparing for NERC audits, you know, that, that really put a lot of pressure uh, from a regulatory standpoint uh, on our organization to try to be in compliant and protect our systems. But it, it's, you know, from a resource standpoint, you know, it's some days it's it's more resources than we have to give, but it's necessary. Um, and so I'll just kind of put a plug in that um, everybody's kind of got their own policy objectives, but we've got one objective. I got to keep the lights on and I got to do it as affordably as possible while I'm moving in to the future. And that is a daily challenge for us. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll echo what Rudy just said, because I mean, I think one of our challenges that we find, I mean, you know, the some of the requirements and regulations that we have, uh, I mean, the, the technologies that we're able to utilize are actually counter to some of the regulations that we have to comply with. And it becomes this dichotomy and this, this disconnect that makes it challenging. Uh, you know, we've, I mean, just like Rudy said, I mean, our, our cyber folks, so we've gone from having, you know, one or two who may have done it part time. To, uh, we we got a whole whole team now that's just you know that's what they do and and working through the, the documentation and working through the requirements and making sure that uh, you know uh, I mean there's a lot of uh, a lot of 
possibilities and connections that we could make that, you know, that, hey, those are buttoned up and we know exactly where, uh, who can come in and who can't uh, to help make sure that things are secure. Thank you. I was wondering, Mark, do you have anything to add on this issue? Uh, thank you, Llewellyn. Uh, yes, as I was sitting here listening to the policy discussion, you know, it, it became apparent to me that uh, uh, folks uh, on the call from the utilities, you know, really ha have to do these four things. Uh, they have to provide reliable power. It has to be affordable. In cybersecurity, it has to be resilient. And of course, today, uh, it has to be clean. Well, they don't have a choice to pick. Of the, they have to do all four, all four. Um, and so that's why I think you see NERC, when they look at reliability, and they talk about, wait, we have an alert here, the real warning. I mean, they've alerted us on the inverter-based resources becoming a potential problem on integration and operation and grid disturbance. They have now alerted us on the policy coordination because they see that if you're going to impose these burdens on our utilities, who's really, whose job is to make sure that, as Elliot said, keep the lights on, right? Provide the heat, provide the basic human needs reliably and affordably, but now you have to be resilient. These utilities, muni-owned co-ops, have to come up with costs that their ratepayers have to bear to ensure that it's resilient, and you got to meet the cyber threats. And the fact is, these cyber threats are so significant that in the old days, they would likely be seen as acts of war, depending on where they were coming from. Today, a lot of the government agencies expect the utilities themselves to protect the systems and then don't share the information that the federal government might have as to what the threats are. So very, very complicated. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad you have these discussions so that we can have a conversation about uh, all of the opportunities, but all the challenges that face uh, these people. It, Mark, just just uh, when when I was at DOE, uh, the uh, I too think that cyber attacks by one country on another country, and people die if they're if you know at a hospital that you they lose electricity. Um, that that could be considered an act of war. And what are the rules of engagement for that? I do think we don't have them. Uh, I asked, what are we doing about this? And the answer was, we don't know what to do. And I really think we need some focus on that as, as everything relies on electricity. So Thank you. Howard, do you have something to add? Yeah, if I could just add a, a couple of points here. One of them is... Uh, you know, from, from a cybersecurity perspective, um, you know, we are, we are unique in our sector in that we are the only sector that has mandatory and enforceable standards. So at least there's a minimum bar that's established there for those that cybersecurity. It's interesting that we're talking about this today because I just came from a panel on cloud computing and how that could how some of those technologies could actually be uh, incorporated into this. So it was a and it was a very lively discussion uh, for about an hour and a half or so. And then if I could just put a plug in for our EI SEC, you know, uh, you, Mark, you talked a little bit about uh, information exchange. Our uh, EI SEC is very active in this area and gets information out as we get it to our participants and our and our users for that. So uh, I do think that there's good energy exchange. Could it be better? And could we have better communication between our government partners and us? It, it, we can always improve, but I do think there's a really good information exchange that occurs on our side. Thank you. Ken Solestein. Yes, I'd like to ask our battery expert a question about the future of battery technology. Right now, uh, it centers on lithium ion batteries that are short term, uh, maybe to fill in a four hour gap. Uh, so I have two questions. What technologies are on the horizon that will advance that, maybe making it longer term? Uh, and then secondly, at what point do you expect battery storage to gain market share, making natural gas less relevant in terms of a backup source for renewables? Sure, certainly. Um, 
most, uh, as you already mentioned, most technology right now is based on lithium ion. The, the thing about lithium ion, though, that that is really a, a family of products. It, it's not just one type of battery that has. And, and so all of these chemistries will have different type of attributes to them. Um, there is a lot of discussion these days also about sodium ion, and that's just replacing then the lithium that you would find in the one side of the of the cell with with sodium that's in it. The problem is is that that's only less than twenty percent or thirty percent of the build material, and it wouldn't be that strongly impactful in the system, and it really reduces energy density. And the energy density is how much energy can be stored in one of these cells. So an example of this is a today's cell or cell maybe five years ago may have weighed a pound. It had copper in it, had, it had aluminum in it, had lithium in it, had nickel in it, and it may have had a capacity of say 20 amp hours. Today, that same battery made out of the same material also weighing a pound now will produce 30, 35 amp hours. So what's happening is that for this, the same amount of material, the amp hours or the amount of storage we can create is going up. And so this is where the trend is going. So it's not that lithium would be removed. It would probably will be exchanged with systems such as lithium metal, and, and you could see extensive increases in storage. Uh, there's other, and as that starts to happen, and because the materials stay relatively the same, that's when the cost profile also starts to drop. It's not really a function of how much we produce. It's more of a function of how efficiently we can get energy out from the constituents that we put into that cell. So there's a lot of issues right now, obviously in metal pricing that we saw also with lithium pricing. And so that volatility in the market makes it very difficult to predict. For instance, last year was the first time that sales actually went up in price. So the direction went the opposite way of where we thought it would go. Um, likely, I don't see some type of parity happening until beyond 2030, really, because of the fact of the demands that the automotive market also plays onto those same resources. Thank you. Thank um, you. If I could, uh, Matthew, I could just jump David, in. Could I, Uber Llewellyn, can I just jump in with one quick thing on this? Uh, hold on a moment. Let me just finish. Sure. Uh, Matthew Daly has had to leave us, and uh, he thanks you all very much. He's had to go to on assignment. Um, okay, go ahead, Elliot. Uh, I was just going to uh, suggest, Ken, uh, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the uh, what's called the liftoff report from DOE with regard to long duration energy storage. Did you take a look at that? Take a look at the webinar that they produced a couple months ago. Uh, as you may know, there's different types of storage. There's mechanical, there's thermal, there's electrochemical. Not all of them rely on lithium or on critical minerals. And so I'm hopeful that just as we've seen the cost curve come down on many other technologies, that we're going to see long-term economic, uh, long duration energy storage know, within the next 10 years coming to uh, fruition. Uh, throughout Let, the years. Elliot, if, if you've inspired me to, we, we did a study of California, a technology study, not a policy study, um, looked at wind and solar generation every day of the year in, in one year. Uh, and these are data, not modeling. There were 90 days in one year in California with little to no wind. And there were 10 days in a row with little to no wind. That's that's a, both a storage challenge and an operational challenge uh, that that they need to be working together. So absolutely, absolutely. And the long duration energy storage is designed to look at like the seven to 10 day period when you might not have sun or you might not have wind for a period of time. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Herman. Uh, thanks, Llewellyn. Uh, this discussion is uh, exactly what I've been thinking about, uh, the, the question I wanted to ask. Um, in my interviews with Julia Souter, who's the executive director of the Long Duration Energy Storage Council and other uh, storage experts, they talk about the fact that it's very clear what needs to get done right now is dealing with uh, lithium ion batteries that we need right now and the supply chains and other factors, uh, IRS uh, guidance and so forth. But that's all part of the good news for General Garza and General Naylor in this uh, embattled uh, terminology that you were using a few minutes ago with uh, security issues. Um, because what they do is they have very coherent, very thorough, very uh, reworked planning programs. And I happen to be looking at some of the plans that they that they have online uh, last week. Um, CPS Energy 
is going to spend over three quarters of the of its budget on operational technologies this year, 2023. Um, it, the, he's, it, it, the Vision 2027 talks about investments in all kinds of data analysis technologies and integration technologies. Um, I'm a little bit more concerned uh, with um, uh, Rayburn's uh, plans because it doesn't specify that. I'm not saying that it doesn't have Herman, those kinds Herman, of plans. what is the question? <laughs> Always that question, not that issue. Um, my question is, um, Rudy and David, how do you plan to meet all of these various needs, the, the, the four needs that Mark de defined uh, over time? What is, what is coming soon? What is coming later? Uh, and how many of those 360,000 poles need, uh, that uh, that Melanie talked about need to get built this year, for instance, and all of the other questions embedded in that? David, why don't you start us off? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I think, the Herman, the challenge that we have is, uh, is, especially in the market that we're in, I mean, we're just seeing 10% seeing growth just to meet the existing uh, needs and, and that doesn't even account and that's per year that doesn't even account for uh, the the additional of electric vehicles or the additional storage and so i mean candidly we're just trying to stay above you know, keep our heads above water just with that now we are being trying to be proactive and uh, i mean i can tell you the last three years we have upgraded our standard conductor size and, and 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 infrastructure, just recognizing that we need to be thinking about future needs and at least you know can we push you know by push off the upgrades down the road a few more years by by build, building bigger now. Um, so you know we're 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 trying to tackle all those things as we as we uh, as we can. Uh, sometimes it's, it's just a matter of here's what we have today and here's what, I mean, again, here's what we're able to do today, uh, be it uh, regulatory or even just the economic side of things. Yeah, from, from, my, from my standpoint, Herman, I, I've got to, uh, investment in my enterprise system is priority number one for me. I can't do anything else uh, in terms of my transformation if I don't upgrade my, my computer systems to deal with the cyber responsibilities to, to improve my customer experience, to create billing options that allow for time of use, you know, uh, 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 programs and things that we're trying to get our, our customers to start thinking about. Um, you know, we are number one in, in uh, solar in the state of Texas. We're number five in the country. We're number two in wind. Uh, and so we have some very, very aggressive climate goals as a community in San Antonio that I've got to pay attention to. So, so I've got to continue to, to, to drive down the price of solar, to add battery storage uh, over the next five years as a priority. And then I've got to also focus on ensuring I've got enough dispatchable power to, to, to cover my system uh, during those, really not so much even on the, uh, for the, the summer months, it's more the winter that I'm concerned about uh, dispatchability uh, and so as a strategy, I've got to ensure I can cover our load here in San Antonio. So that's, you know, and I, and I got to hire people a heck of a lot smarter than me to figure it all, to figure out how to make it all, you know, work together. And so those are my priorities for the next five years. I just hired a wonderful strategist, um, you know, to, to help us stretch that vision 2027 uh, uh, goal uh, or strategy out to 2040, 2050 because I've got to show our community what those investments looks like. Because guess what? For us, it's going to be billions and billions of dollars that we're going to have to layer in over time uh, that are going to that that my customers are going to have to understand why it's necessary. So I think the biggest challenge in all of this for every utility company in the country, and, and you're seeing the impacts of it out in California right now. How do you keep rates affordable? Trying to meet all of these policy goals, it is going to be a real challenge you know, for our customers to understand why these investments are necessary, you know, and, and how we're going to ensure they can, they can keep their own lights on and, and, you know, by paying their own bills. So it's a challenge for us. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have one other thing that, uh, you know, Herman, that we have, have started doing is, 
how do we put this information into the the uh, I mean, if we're co-ops or our members, but the consumer's hands, how do we put it in a way that uh, they're able to use it, they're able to understand it, and they're able to react? So, you know, we're tackling this these challenges not only from the wholesale level, but even at the at the local level, uh, trying to put information in those hands. You know, whether it's the apps, whether it's the dashboards, you know. So that way they are able to react and, and adapt accordingly as well. Thank you. We've come to the end of our time together. I'd like to ask a final question, which is sort of implicit in everything, but not specifically answered, maybe a little bit by Rudy and, and David. Uh, and that is, how are we going to get from here to 2050 when everybody says we're going to double the need for electricity uh, and we don't have a clear roadmap to get there. Anybody like to tackle that? Melanie, you have a a look about you that you're keen to say something. Well, the uh, the uh, I was just thinking it is we need the roadmap. And uh, I, of course, think from a federal level, but but we need I, I think the point about working with states and localities and co-ops and, and uh, the different kinds of utilities, I think that is essential. We need to do it very, very quickly. I think we need a quadrennial energy review, um, uh, which my office managed in the, uh, the Obama administration. And uh, I think it is absolutely critical right now. But I would add one thing to that, as we are talking about electrification of transportation and buildings, we need to be very mindful of the technology limitations of things that we cannot electrify. And that is a lot of our industrial processes and the impacts of electrification on things that can't be electrified in the near to midterm. And, and I would worry about one, uh, one thing in particular, the cost shifting to the infrastructure that the Indion as we electrify everything. It's just one of the many, many things that we need to consider here, um, not just electrifying everything, but what about the things that we can't electrify, which says we need a huge plan, comprehensive plan, so. You know, what I would add to what Melanie just said is that uh, we need uh, a way to mobilize and make sure that we mobilize the private sector because the tremendous yeah, right. resources, financial right. resources that are there. Uh, the DOE talks about uh, a private sector-led, government-enabled, uh, policies. And I think mobilizing the private sector is going to be one key area getting from here to 2050. The other one is to recognize that even as we make all these investments, which probably will mean more money needing to be spent, not by just but obviously by customers, we're going to need to, we'll be spending less on gas and on but, other energy. So it'll be a- well, then We're out of time. I thank uh, Melanie in particular for a wonderful summation. Couldn't be a better end. And likewise, Elliot, and all of you for being a truly super panel, very informative, very frank. And I thank my colleagues of the media as well. And now I hand it over to Mark to say farewell. Again, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, I think we set the stage for future panels and I look forward to getting us back together so we can continue our discussion. Rudy, I think you laid the foundation for a series of panels going forward. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Thank you, thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bye -bye. Mark. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers. Bye.